you hear me okay? Your lapel mic's muted. On the top box. <coughs> I thought I turned it on. It's not registering here. It's opposite of mute. It's on now. <laughs> It is an honor and an anticipated blessing to study God's Word with you this morning. In the English language, we have one word to describe our appreciation for food, our affection for a human being, and our love for God. And that word is love. In the Greek language, there are four words to describe your appreciation for a wonderful meal, your affection for someone else, and for God. I am going to study one of those words with you this morning, which I believe is the most important word in all of the New Testament. Since I'm not a preacher or a scholar, the best that I can do is share with you in the form of a study the understanding that I have asked God to give me about this word and trust that the Holy Spirit will illumine your mind as to the gospel truth of God's love for the human race. In preparing this study, I quickly became convinced that the love of God cannot be defined or explained in human terms because the love of God is beyond human description. So, what I'm going to attempt to do this morning is contrast God's love with human love. And that is why I have chosen the title, You Turn a God. That may sound like a very strange title for you for a morning, Sabbath morning message. So let me explain what I mean by You Turn a God. In the New Testament, when the Bible writers wrote about the love of God, they used a very obscure verb called agape. When they wrote about human love, they used the verb philos, or phileo. So, when the Bible writers wrote about the power, the passion, and the intensity of God's love for us, they used the word agape. When the Bible writers wrote about human love, they used philos. Philos is talking about the selfishness, the self-centeredness of human love. So, when we are considering the topic or the subject of love, we need to recognize that God's love is always focused away towards others. Human love Philos is egocentric. It's focused towards us. For example, after Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit, what did she do? She brought the fruit of Adam to eat. Did Adam know that the fruit that Eve had brought for him to eat was the forbidden fruit? Yes. yes. Did Adam know that if he ate of the forbidden fruit, he would die? Yes. yes. Then why did Adam eat of the forbidden fruit? Knowing what the consequences would be. Before Adam had eaten, before Eve had eaten the forbidden fruit, what had happened? Satan had succeeded in deceiving her. Where did we learn that? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Satan deceived Eve into eating the forbidden fruit. But Adam was not deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. So why did Adam knowingly, willingly, and deliberately eat of the forbidden fruit knowing what the consequences would be? Before he ate the forbidden fruit, she and God were on the same side of agape love. But once she chose to eat of the forbidden fruit, she joined the side of Satan. 
who had initiated a great controversy in the universe with God. So, after Eve chose to eat of the forbidden fruit, she and God were no longer on the same side of agape love. And now Adam was faced with a decision. And the decision was that he needed to make a choice. Not between himself and God, or between himself and Eve, but between God and Eve. Adam loved both of them. But now that Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit, he had to make a choice. So, he decided that God was not capable of creating another Eve for him. So he ate of the forbidden fruit. What happened the instant that Adam ate of the forbidden fruit? The author of the book, Steps to Christ, on page 40, makes an amazing statement. Agape love disappeared, and selfishness took its place. The agape love that Adam used to have always focused away from himself, now made a new turn and was focused on himself. The agape love that Adam used to have for God and Eve now became focused on Adam. Adam now became the number one priority in Adam's life. God and Eve were no longer Adam's number one priority. So, after they ate of the forbidden fruit, what happened? God comes to see them in the Garden of Eden. And he says, where are you two? Notice the first evidence of eternal agape in the human being. Adam responds to God's question, where are you two? By responding very interestingly. Notice the continuous use of the personal pronoun I. I heard you in the garden. I became afraid. So I hid myself because I am naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree that I asked you not to eat of? What was Adam's response? The woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me to eat of the tree. And so I ate of the tree. Adam instinctively chose not to take responsibility for what he had done. I believe that they were highest because they thought that possibly God had come to execute them. Since God had told them in Genesis 3.3 that the day that you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. God, however, had come to introduce them to plan B. Plan B is the new covenant plan of salvation. First recorded in Genesis 3.15. When God says to Satan, Eve, and Adam, I'm going to put Satan, enmity between you and the woman, and between her seed and your seed. And you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. 4,000 years later, when Jesus presents himself to John the Baptist to be baptized, the author of the book Desire of Ages tells us an amazing statement. Page 113. Quote, God desired to teach those present at Jesus' baptism that from God's own agape love comes the free gift which reconciles the world to Him. Which meant that the words that God spoke to Jesus at His baptism in the Jordan, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3, 17, included the whole human race. Isn't that beautiful? It included the whole human race. Why would Jesus be willing to genetically, genetically contaminate himself with my sinful nature, my weaknesses, Hebrews 4.15? Why would he be willing to do that? The answer is in 1 Corinthians 13.5. Agape love is never focused on self. It's always focused outwards to others. So, when Jesus was faced with the choice of remaining in the splendor of heaven, with all of the adoration of the heavenly host focused on him, 
Philippians 2 6. What did he say to God? Philippians 2 7. I no longer wish to remain with you here any longer. For 4,000 years, I have looked forward to go to planet Earth and redeem those that I love more than I love myself. Amen. Ooh. Heaven is where I assume all of you want to be taken to someday. Yet heaven is where Jesus chose not to remain. Because there was a plan of salvation and redemption that needed to be established and completed. The motivation and the power that makes a plan of salvation possible is agape love. The most sublime statement that I'm aware of in the New Testament is one of the verses of our scripture reading this morning. 1 John 4 8. He that is not indwelt with agape love cannot know God, for God is love. John is not saying that one of God's characteristics is agape love. No. What he's saying is that every aspect of God's character is driven by agape love. We, however, are now driven by you turn agape. Yes, with the same power, passion, and intensity of God's love. Did, were we not created in His image and in His likeness? Amen. But that love, that power, that intensity is now focused on me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many Bibles you have. I have seven. Two in the original languages. And none of my Bibles say that I need to love myself as much as I love others. <laughs> the greatest evil that you and I face today is not dying from some horrible disease or from some terrorist act. The greatest evil that you and I face today is dealing with this terminal condition which I describe as you turn agape. According to scripture, is there an antidote? Is there a solution for this condition Amen. called U-turn agape? In other words, how do you and I regain or experience something that is no longer part of our standard equipment? <laughs> the prevalent thinking in the Christian world, all denominations including ours, is that you and I must now take the initiative to prove to God how much we appreciate Jesus having come to this world and dying for us. And if we do not take that initiative through sincerity and actions, we're doomed to be lost. Amen. We are taught today that Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection is only a provision. It's only an offer for us to be saved. In other words, if we do not exercise willpower and through fear and trembling to earn our salvation, we will be lost. I have good news for you. Real good news. Scripture teaches the very opposite of this prevalent teaching in the Christian world today. And I'm going to prove it to you from Scripture. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are we here to study Scripture? Yes. Amen. I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When you get there, say ready, and I'm going to read one verse to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Amen. Are we ready? Yes. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. By God's doing. Who took the initiative here? God takes the initiative. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us what? Wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So if you're going to boast about something, verse 31, 1 Corinthians 1, boast about God having taken the initiative to redeem you. Does that mean that everyone that's ever been born on this earth is going to be saved? 
course not. That's not what the Bible is talking about. What it means is that everyone may receive the free gift of salvation, which Paul describes in great detail in Romans 5, verses 15, 16, and 17, where Paul identifies what salvation is by saying that salvation is free twice, and it is a gift five times in three verses. What this free gift means to you and to me is that Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection has reconciled the human race back to God. In other words, you and I legally stand before God as Adam and Eve did before they sinned. That's what reconcile means in the Greek language. If you and I accept these biblical facts, then the question that we must entertain this morning is how is you turn agape restored back to its original purpose? Would you like to learn the first biblical step in restoring you turn agape? Back to where it was. I now invite you to turn to the left and look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Beginning with verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience... You are slaves of the one that you have chosen to obey. If you choose sin, Satan, you will enjoy life on this earth as television commercials advertise. Which leads to eternal death. If you choose Jesus as your slave, as become a slave to Jesus, what does it result in? Righteousness and obedience. The word obedience is not talking about you doing anything. It talks about you listening attentively to God's voice as He wants to restore you to an life in your life. Now, if you choose to become a slave to Christ, there are some real, real goodies here. Let me read verse 22 to you of Romans chapter 6. But now, having been freed from sin, it's not talking about sin as a verb, it's talking about sin as a condition, an adjective. Look it up in your Bible, in your concordance. But now, having been freed from sin, because you've chosen to become enslaved to whom? To God. You derive your benefit, resulting in what? Sanctification. Sanctification is a very fancy word to describe Christian living. God's version of Christian living. Not what is being taught today. Christian living, sanctification, and the outcome is what? Eternal life. Eternal life. Do you like those results? If you choose to become a slave to Christ. The question is, who takes the initiative in making this first step a reality? Ever since the Old Testament, we learn that it is God that takes the initiative to draw the people in the Old Testament to Him. Because God inspires Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 verse 3. And He says, In spite of Israel's continuous resistance and apostasy, Jeremiah says, even though you continue to resist me, I have continued to draw you to me. How? With threats and force? No, with loving kindness. That's what the Old Testament says about who takes the initiative in restoring you turn about it. Back to its original purpose. What about the New Testament? In Acts chapter 26, verse 14, an incredible event is recorded. In this event, we have the Apostle Paul giving a Bible study to King Agrippa. And Paul says to King Agrippa, Do you know, King Agrippa, why I have chosen to become a slave to Jesus Christ? 
Because on my way to Damascus, with official documents from all the religious leaders in Jerusalem, Jesus himself appears to me with a blinding light which knocks me and my party down to the ground. We couldn't see anything. But that's not all Jesus did to you. Now Jesus audibly speaks to me. And he says, Saul, Saul, why you continue to persecute me? Isn't it difficult, Saul, to keep kicking against thorns of the gold bush? I believe that Jesus had been taking the initiative to pursue Paul Amen. long before the road to Damascus experience. Amen. Because my Bible says in Acts chapter 7, verse 58, that before Stephen was stoned to death, the man that stoned Stephen to death took off their coats, the Bible says, out of garments, and laid them at the feet of a young man by the name of Saul. That's Paul's name before he was converted. Then they proceeded to stone Stephen to death. Have you ever been hit by a rock? Yeah. Does it hurt? Yes. I've got scars in my head from stupidly participating in rock fights when I was a kid. <laughs> but when you stone someone to death, that means that the majority of those rocks landed on the head. And under those circumstances, we learn in, chapter, in verse 60 of Acts 7, how Jesus wanted for Saul to see the behavior of a human being that had allowed God to return you to agape back to its original purpose. Because Stephen's last recorded words, as he's being stoned to death, are, Lord, do not hold this against them. This is a human being that is being murdered, and his concern is not for himself, but the people that are murdering him. What about today? Is there any evidence in the Bible that God is the one that takes the initiative to restore you turn God back to its place? In Revelation 3.20, we learn that God, Jesus, sent the Holy Spirit to knock on the door of whose heart? But this is a very different door. It's different because there is no handle on the outside of this door. This door can only be opened from the inside. And that's your and my choice. In the most famous Bible study recorded in the Bible, John chapter 3, we have theologian Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night because Nicodemus has been attracted and drawn by Jesus' teachings and his humble behavior. Now, this Bible story has very significant applications to you and to me. Because just like Nicodemus was very knowledgeable about all the facts and information in the Bible, you and I are also full of facts and information. Nicodemus had come to enter into a discussion with Jesus about his mission and his authority. What is significant about this Bible study to you and to me today? The Nicodemus knew why Israel was under the bondage of an alien nation. He knew that the reason that they were in bondage is because Israel had rejected all of the prophets that God had sent them. In some cases, murdered them. The significance to you and to me is this. You and I know, if we study, that the reason that Jesus has not returned and cannot return is because of insubordination. Do you know what the word insubordination means? Disobedience. Out and out rejection of authority. Don't take my word for it. In the little book called Evangelism, 
There's a very, very interesting title to one of the last chapters. Evangelism has 20 sections. The 20th section towards the end of the book has a chapter titled, are you ready for this? The second chapter. The reason for the delay. In that chapter, she uses the word insubordination. So, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, wanting to enter into an intellectual discussion with Jesus about Jesus' mission and authority. And Jesus lays bare the difference immediately between facts and information and truth. And he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You need a new heart. And it would serve no useful purpose for me to enter into a conversation with you about my mission and my authority because number one, you wouldn't understand what in the world I'm talking about. And number two, you wouldn't appreciate it. Years later, when Nicodemus saw Jesus hanging on the cross, he remembered what Jesus had said to him. Just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. The Holy Spirit convicted Nicodemus' heart. And he recognized that the one that had given him that Bible study was the Redeemer of Israel. The Savior of the world. And his heart was convicted. And an incredible change took place in Nicodemus' life. After Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven, Nicodemus saw that that young church was being persecuted. And under those conditions, he stepped forward and supported that little church, that little group of people, financially. That's not all he did. He publicly encouraged them to preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The chapter in Desire of Ages named Nicodemus also points out that, that Nicodemus' financial support of that young church brought him financial poverty. But that's not all it brought him. It brought him the scorn of his former colleagues, religious leaders, that used to esteem Nicodemus as one of the top religious leaders in all of Israel. Scripture is very, very clear that reversing U-turn agape back to its original purpose is not only possible in our individual lives, but it is absolutely essential in order to vindicate the character of God and the great law of agape love, which Satan says no one can live up to. Satan claimed in heaven that God's agape love, his law based on agape love, was unfair and unjust because no one could live up to it. When Satan succeeded in convincing Eve that she would never be fulfilled as a woman until she knew as much as God did, she needed to learn about evil. Satan exalted. Because he said, here is God's first creation with his own hands. And what have they chosen to do? They've chosen to rebel against God and join me. Many have asked, if God is really a God of love, why did he wipe out Satan and a third of the population in heaven that rebelled against him in heaven? And if he didn't do that, why didn't he wipe out Adam and Eve after they sinned and start over again with Adam and Eve number two? The answer is because agape love has to be understood, convicted heart, and then expressed to those that we come in contact with. It's called witnessing. <laughs> Remember that question that Jesus' disciples asked him in Matthew 24, 
When they say to him, Okay, you've convinced us that your kingdom is not of this earth. So please tell us, when are you coming back? Would you like to know when Jesus is coming back like his disciple? What was Jesus' response? Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness. Word witness is a meaning.